Tanya Hosh, um, leader, change maker, and visionary. Uh, 2021 SA Australian of the Year. Um, Tanya is also the first Indigenous person and second woman appointed to the AFL executive. Um, and she has held leadership roles in sport, the arts, culture, social justice, and public policy. Um, one of the preeminent Indigenous leaders pursuing constitutional recognition of Australia's First Nations people. Tanya's principal leadership is transforming the AFL, advancing women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, gender diverse Australians, and supporting the entire community. So Tanya championed the first Indigenous player statue of Nikki Winmar. I won't um, reenact it because I don't have the body for it. Um, <laughs> and instigated a review of anti-vilification policy within the AFL also. She helped secure an apology for Adam Goods from the AFL and delivered a new industry framework to help prevent racist treatment of players. Um, Tanya also helped found adv advocacy organisation, the Indigenous Players Alliance. She drove a new respect and responsibility policy enabling women to seek re redress for unacceptable behaviour in a world first gender diversity policy for, for contact sport. And in 2020, she drove a hugely successful social media campaign aimed at informing and protecting indigenous communities from COVID-19. And more recently, you would have seen Tanya spoke at the um, announcement that the that Prime Minister Albanese um, made around the, um, the date for the referendum. So we're um, really, really happy and, and it is a privilege to have you here with us today, Tanya. Um, really appreciate you being available to talk to the Samri community and share yeah, some of your thoughts and insights around what we're about to embark upon as a country, um, the choice in front of us, and you know, and and be really great just to hear, I guess, why you feel it's important for us when we get to the polls to make the choice. Um, that you're going to make, um, and then why you know why you feel like that that decision is, I guess, the way forward for Australia as a country. So, without further ado, people, I'd like to welcome Tanya Hosh. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Cody. Thanks for that uh, very long introduction. Um, um, really appreciate it, and thanks everyone for taking the time out of your day to. Um, have a yarn about this. Um, what I thought I might do is just sort of give a quick overview about the constitution and its history, um, what um, the processes are for changing the constitution and um, what the, the task is ahead of us in terms of this particular referendum on the 14th of October. So um, the reason I want to start right at the beginning is because I realise that a lot of us don't have a lot of requirement to look at the Australian Constitution, but it is an important national document. Uh, so the Australian Constitution was forged in 1901, and basically it's the document that is referred to as the birth certificate of the nation because it's the it's the legal document that brought us together um, into a federated nation um, called Australia. Uh, and, and brought the states and territories together. So um, when it was forged, it was written by some older white men on a boat off Sydney Harbour. Um, there was almost a universal belief back then um, by the colonisers that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people would die out, and so they saw no need to um, make any accommodations for us or mention our existence when they put the constitution together. So um, that is one of the reasons that um, we're not mentioned in the document. So at the moment, um, given its history, we've got a constitution that recognises lighthouses, it recognises coinage, it recognises Queen Victoria, but is completely silent about the First Peoples of the country. Um, but despite that, there are sections of the Constitution that um, do enable discrimination on the basis of race. Now, a lot of people 
are familiar uh, with the 1967 referendum, which is the most successful in Australia's history. Um, that referendum was remarkable for a number of different reasons. Um, but before I go into that, I want to talk about why um, the Australian Constitution is so difficult to change. Um, it is considered one of the most difficult um, in the world to change uh, because in Australia, to change the Constitution, uh, what our rule book says, which is the Constitution itself, is that we have to get a double majority of support for any changes. So that means we need the majority of all Australians to vote yes, but we also need the majority of people in the majority of states to vote yes. And so that means in the second count, the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory don't count because they're not states. So their vote counts once to the national number, but it doesn't um, get a second count in the way the states do. So if you want a constitutional referendum to fail, all you need to do is get three states to vote it down and, and um, not achieve a majority of support in those states because if you get three states to vote it down, that means we can't get four states to vote it up. And so it's a much easier task um, to um, bury a referendum as we frequently have. So since 1901, we've gone to the polls 44 times over our history to change the constitution, but we've only ever changed it eight times. The last time was in 1977, and that was to change the constitution to alter the retiring age, of, the retiring age of judges in our uh, judicial system. Uh, so it does show we can get it together on the big things. Uh, the 1967 referendum was so significant because it is actually uh, the most successful referenda in Australia's history because almost 91% of all Australians voted yes. Now, a lot of people think that that's when we got the right to vote as Indigenous Australians, but that's not correct. Uh, we got uh, the right to vote in different states and territories before that. Um, 1967 um, was a referendum that uh, was about counting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the census, so counting us as citizens because we had not been counted up until that point in time. Um, but the other major change that came in with that uh, constitutional change was to move the jurisdiction of decision-making about laws in relation to people of a certain race, being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples at the time, um, to the Commonwealth and remove the, ju the jurisdiction of that decision-making from the states. As a lot of you on this call will know, a lot of the states and territories had some, um, uh, you know, extremely... Um, marginalising um, policies and legislation in place uh, governing the movements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and so moving the jurisdiction um, to the Commonwealth was seen as a very good thing. Now, the way that that clause is written, um, it doesn't say whether those laws can be made to our benefit or our detriment. So there is a bit of a loophole there, but that is the part of the constitution that allows things like native title to exist because it's a head of power in the constitution. Uh, rather than go into deep constitutional law with you, uh, not that I'm qualified to do that anyway, um, I want to move on to why it is that we're having this conversation now. It's been hundreds of years um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been asking for respect and recognition uh, through um, the various mechanisms in Australia, including in the constitution. So this is not a new conversation. It's in fact been going for hundreds of years in one way, shape or form. The current iteration started with uh, Julia Gillard when she was Prime Minister and she established an expert panel of eminent Australians to come together and consult the nation on if we were to recognise First Peoples in the Constitution, what would that look like and would there be support for such a move? Um, since then, they produced an almost 600-page report um, after about 12 to 18 months of work consulting around the country, um, suggesting that we needed a whole range of things to um, get ahead of uh, having a referendum. 
uh, some of you might recall the recognised movement that I was part of, and that was the community awareness raising um, of a pre-referendum environment. Because one of the reasons that a lot of referenda fail is that a lot of people don't know anything about it until uh, the day or the days before they vote, and because they're not informed, they will choose usually to vote no. So um, the awareness raising conversation has been ha being had in the country for at least um, 12 years now. Um, and in that time, there's been um, other work that has taken place um, to establish what would the actual words of change be that we would be considering. So uh, some of you might have heard of the referendum um, Council, of which I was a member, and we consulted around Australia. We had 12 different meetings um, that culminated in a, a national meeting called um, the Uluru Meeting in 2017. Now, um, that meeting comprised of um, 120 people who'd been elected from the 12 meetings that had happened around Australia um, by other Indigenous people that intended those meetings. So they were all Indigenous participants. And then there was an extra 120 or so who were selected from um, key Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, organisations across the country to come together for three days. And that's where the Uluru Statement from the Heart um, was uh, finally um, supported by the vast majority of the delegates at that Uluru meeting in 2017. Um, that uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was announced um, on the um, election of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese as something that the Labor government, his Labor government, were committing to uh, implementing in full. It's important to remember that the Uluru Statement covers three elements. It covers um, a voice to parliament that requires constitutional change. It also covers a truth-telling process and a Makarata Commission, which is a um, treaty-making or agreement-making framework. Now, the latter two that I mentioned uh, don't require any changes to the constitution, and so that's not what that is why they're not being spoken about as part of this campaign, but they're very much part of the Uluru Statement and very part, very much part of the Labor Party um, platform. And I know that there is um, foundational work being taking place on those other two matters in the background. Now, as I said, um, to change the constitution, it's a really difficult task. This will be the first um, referendum in the age of social media. Um, for those of us who are old enough to remember voting in the last referendum in the late 90s on a republic for the country and leaving the Commonwealth, um, you might recall we didn't even have smartphones back then. Um, and so the landscape has changed significantly. Um, social media is a blessing and a curse as a campaigner um, because a lot of misinformation can be spread very easily through social media um, and there's no laws against um, that that, you know, really satisfy um, ensuring that people only have the facts. Um, in addition to that, we've never had a referendum pass that... Um, has not enjoyed the support of um, both major political parties. And this will be, if we're successful, this would be the first referendum to ever be successful without bipartisanship. Um, obviously our parliament has changed form and shape a lot in terms of the representatives and independents, um, the Greens um, and things like that. So really now it's a matter of multi-partisanship. Um, but the coalition have made it clear that um, the majority of their party is um, determining not to support the, um, the voice to parliament. So when we go to vote on October 14, there's really two things to think about that we're voting for. The first one is the um, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution, recognition that we exist um, and have always been here. Um, but like any constitutional change, there's always a lot of concern about um, unintended legal consequences. And there's a lot of people who think very carefully about the wording to ensure that 
um, the the changes to the constitution are not going to enable things that are unintended um, from a legal perspective. Um, and so um, through the consultation through the last couple of decades of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, there's a couple of things that have been very, very clear from the outset. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are largely supportive of being recognised in the constitution. Not all of us are, but the vast majority of us are. The polling tells us consistently that 80% of Indigenous Australians support the recognition in the constitution, but would never settle just for symbolic recognition alone. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples want any change to the constitution um, to come with some meaningful change as well. And so a lot of very careful thought has gone into a model that we believe could win popular support across the country to vote yes, um, not being seen as a threat or uh, legal recklessness. And so that is one of the reasons that we actually have such a modest model um, being proposed in this instance. So the voice to parliament is the other part of um, the reference in the constitution and that's what we're being asked to vote on. So um, we're being asked to vote um, for the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution through a voice to parliament. Now, um, the voice to parliament design has not happened and that won't happen unless we have a successful yes vote, but there are nine principles that will guide um, the underpinnings of the development of the voice. The voice itself will be set out under Commonwealth legislation and so it will have to pass both houses of the federal parliament um, and everyone who is uh, currently responsible for passing all our laws and legislation um, at the parliamentary level, this will be no different. So some of the principles that underpin the voice will be issues like gender balance, um, representation of um, age groups and geographical location and diversity. Um, the voice to parliament will hold no veto rights over the sovereignty of the parliament, so it will have no ability to interfere with the processes or mechanisms or decision-making of the federal parliament. Um, it is simply advisory. And that is why some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are not supportive of the voice to parliament because they can see that this is... Um, you know, not giving substantial power of any type at all. Um, one of the reasons that myself and um, I think a lot of other Indigenous people think this is important, though, is because it will actually provide for a permanent and ongoing mechanism through which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples can make um, representations to the federal parliament and the executive government, which means the cabinet, and that will be ongoing. I think for people in the Samri environment, you'd be more aware um, than most about the uh, consequences of the policies and laws and colonisation that have um, and the impacts that that have had on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, and because um, a lot of this disadvantage has become so entrenched. Um, definitely, you know, having an advisory committee that only lasts for the length of one political cycle or one election or one prime minister is not ever going to be enough to really help us build the sort of momentum towards the positive changes that we need to see to truly have an impact on improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, stemming from the perspectives, lived experience and expertise of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So that's what the Voice to Parliament is about. Um, that is its intention to make representations to the Parliament and the executive government on um, issues of importance and concern to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. All of the representatives on The Voice will be elected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in um, regional boundaries that are yet to be determined. Um, but in a nutshell, um, that is what this referendum is about on October 14. Um, there's about 17 million Australians enrolled to vote and um, it's really, really important that Australia takes this opportunity um, to have a say over really um, 
remedying um, this long overdue recognition and a um, framework to enable an ongoing dialogue directly from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to the federal parliament and the executive government. Happy to take questions. And I hope that's what you were after, Clyde. Hi, Tanya. Um, sorry, just sorting myself out here. Um, so, yeah, no, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, Tanya, I, I guess what I'm really interested in, you've been involved in, in a number of different initiatives that have focused on social reform. Um, you know, I think about, obviously, the AFL is something that has is very near and dear to my heart, growing up in a footy family. Um, but one of the things that's also been quite prominent in that industry over the decades has been the presence of racism. Um, and I think as a country, that is that is something that is a big challenge for us all as, 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 as Australians is, you know, to talk about our shared history, to talk about the inequality that has existed in our shared history. But I guess, you know, for, for those that are either new to this conversation or new to, I guess, the opportunity to be involved in reform, I guess uh, I was wondering if you could, really to speak from your own experience about, I guess, the, I guess the, you know, the, the, the principles of being involved in reform and the opportunity that we have before us, not, you know, not, not the, the inner workings and details of what constitutional reform would mean, but in terms of, I guess, what you really feel like this, this means for the country, if that makes sense, yeah. Yep, I'll have a crack at that. Um, I mean, I I don't consider this referendum question to be a question about reform. Um, in fact, you know, constitutional reform is, um, you know, highly unlikely in Australia given our system. Um, if you look at South Africa, for example, when they ended apartheid, they had a true constitutional reform in that country uh, where they basically rewrote their entire constitution. In Australia, what we tend to do with our constitution, um, because let's face it, even if, um, you know, there's people who feel disadvantaged in Australia and we certainly know Indigenous people um, where the burden of enormous disadvantage. Um, the cons our democracy works pretty um, soundly. And so most Australians don't engage with the Australian constitution because they don't see its relevance to them. Um, so when we make constitutional change in Australia, basically all we do, um, instead of being sort of making bold assertions about the vision who we have as Australians uh, collectively, we just update it to affirm who we already say we are. So this um, change I consider to be incredibly modest because it is only allowing for an advisory committee, albeit a permanent one, um, by virtue of the fact it will be written into the constitution, um, and for the, you know, finally for the First Peoples of the country to be recognised um, as part of um, the fabric of, of Australia. So we tend to make um, very minor changes to the constitution when we make them and they're simply an affirmation of who we say we already are. So I would not consider this a reform process. However, if you think about the fact that you know, in a little over two weeks' time, 17 million Australians will go out to vote um, to finally recognise the true history of the country from the context of the um, position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians. I think that's very powerful. I think that will help put to bed 
if we're successful, a double majority of Australians actually acknowledging a, a, a basic fact um, and a statement of truth. I think coming together to do that and achieve that actually allows us to start moving forward to have different conversations and we get to put this one to bed. Um, the voice to parliament is, is purely an advisory mechanism that will be ongoing. Uh, for people who say um, we'll be divided by race if we do this and that's what makes this a radical reform, a misunderstanding what's already in the constitution because we're, we're already divided by race in the constitution by virtue of the 1967 referendum, which gave the Commonwealth jurisdiction to make laws about people of a certain race. So we're already separated in that way. Um, and the other, I think, uh, mistruth, which tries to paint this change as far more radical than it actually is, is um, the idea that a voice to parliament um, gives, you know, is somehow um, benchmarking an expectation that other groups will need or seek to have similar. The reality is that this is not precedent making. There is already a permanent um, committee written into the constitution and it's called the State Commission. Um, it hasn't often met, but that was to give the states the ability to speak to uh, the, the federated structure should they need to once we came together as an Australian nation. So I don't really consider this reform as much as um, seeking to update the records um, appropriately, but certainly I do believe that um, the majority of Australians um, engaging even just with the symbolic act of voting to recognise us into the constitution certainly is a much better foundation for us to move forward from in terms of some of the much more challenging questions we need to have as a nation when it comes to um, the enjoyment of um, an exercise of the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our own country. Thanks, Tanya. Um, we have another question, um, and it's in regards to the process of community engagement um, and collective decision making that led to the regional dialogues, uh, the meeting at Uluru, and the development of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, it seems to have had or been a very considered methodology around how it got to that point. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, I can. Um... Certainly by the time um, we got to the point of real momentum around constitutional recognition, you know, there was a lot more need to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people specifically on the model for that recognition, what it was going to look like. And it's fair to say that a whole range of propositions were um, canvassed, including Bill of Rights, including an anti-discrimination clause, including a whole range of other things that um, uh, were highly unlikely to meet um, the satisfaction or support of the Australian people to the extent that was required. Um, and so um, there was a number of people who were thinking very hard about this question. And so in the regional dialogues, the voice was one of those um, that I mentioned that was canvassed as an option, it was presented to people to consider, and people had the opportunity to discuss in a lot more detail over a couple of days what they thought um, was the best proposition to take forward. Um, and so taking the feedback from those 12 dialogues and then having the discussion in Uluru over the three days, it was decided that this was our best chance of um, uh, getting the support of the Australian people in enough numbers uh, to really provide a new opportunity, hopefully a fresh conversation and mechanism um, to really, you know, have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples try and hold our federal parliament and governments to higher account and transparency in, term, in terms of decisions that they make in relation to us. 
Um, we've got record numbers of Aboriginal representation in the federal parliament at the moment, and we also see more numbers in our um, state and territory um, parliaments as well. Um, I certainly feel proud every time another black fellow gets elected, but we have to remember that they're there representing their electorate, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I think um, we all know that uh, one black fellow could never represent all of us in any case. Can you imagine? Um, mm. We'll go wild if we thought that was the case. So um, bringing a, a voice together um of people who will be elected by our own people um, was very carefully thought through, as were some of the principles I mentioned before, to make sure that we've got adequate diversity of people sitting around the table. But I think um, what makes it most meaningful is that it will have to be ongoing. Um, and changing the uh, structure and model of the voice through legislation is important because if it was written in, if that sort of detail was written into the constitution, we'd have to have another referendum every time we wanted to change the construct, which would be completely inappropriate and it's not what the constitution is for. Um, it is my expectation that um, this uh, voice will probably be, have some of the most outrageously um, outlandish expectations placed on it. Um, they'll be expected to close all the gaps overnight. Um, there, there will be, you know, a huge amount of pressure on this group. Um, but what I think those of us who are involved in change making know is that change doesn't happen overnight. It's taken a long time to get into uh, the deficit positions that um, we're currently in. Um, and um, it's going to take a long time to even up and um, redress some of the disadvantage that we know exists. Um, but without a voice, without this change, what we have is the status quo. Um, yeah. And uh, not only does that mean that there will be nothing in place that offers us any opportunity for change, but things could even continue to go backwards in some of the areas that we know um, through the closing the gap measures continuing to go backwards. Um, and in the meantime, the lives of our people will be massively disrupted and um, neglected. And so I think, um, you know, the, the symbolic change of the recognition along with this really modest advisory committee ask um, is the least that this country can do. Um, and, you know, then it will be up to all of us to really support the group of individuals that come together to carry that responsibility. Um, and, you know, it is absolutely my expectation that they will have to continue to consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and um, our allies and experts that work alongside us um, pretty continually to make sure they're giving absolutely the best advice um, and evaluating exactly what is working, what is not, and what needs to be different. Thanks, Tanya. Um, we're, we're, we're working very hard here at Samri to provide um, as much information and support and resource to the Samarit community around, you know, what it is that we're moving towards. Um, we have come out publicly as, as an institution in support of the voice to parliament um, and in support of constitutional recognition um, because we see it at work within Samarit and the fact that Wadley Pringa, the Aboriginal Health, um, you know, equity uh, research unit within within summary has been embedded from the beginning, from the, from the, um, you know, from the initial conception of summary. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership principles, insights, lived experience being embedded in what it is that we do from a research perspective here at summary. And also we believe that the voice to the parliament, the indigenous voice to parliament will improve health and wellbeing. We've seen Vacho and a number of other stakeholders come out in recent days, hundreds, um, come out and say the same thing. Um, we believe it. What does a statement like the indigenous voice to parliament will improve 
health and well-being mean to you? Uh, well, you know, I definitely, as you mentioned, I gave a speech on the day of the um, Prime Minister and Premier, um, along with Professor Megan Davis, at the, the announcement of the date of the referendum out in um, Elizabeth. And the day before, I had just come out of hospital after having my lower right leg amputated. Um, I'm type 2 diabetic. Um, I um, have got a number of complications related to that. For the last three years, I've been battling um, a disease related to my diabetes where I had a foot reconstruction, a few hurdles along the way, a few infections. I'd had six surgeries up until that point, trying to save my limb, um, hoping that I would be able to walk again. Um, it certainly uh, kicked my ass when I um, got that diagnosis. Um, and um, I think that, um, you know, my own personal experience in recent years has uh, really helped me to understand um, just um, how much is still lacking. Um, I was uh, in a press conference with the Federal Health Minister, Mark Butler, a couple of days ago about that collection of um, uh, health organisations in support of The Voice. And uh, I had a chat with with him and said, you know, the care that I've had and the services that I've had access to um, in the process of having the amputation have been amazing. They've been, I've had a really positive experience. And at that acute level of care, I've had really great care. But um, what I needed was a, a lot more education and understanding at that preventative level many years ago. Um, my first um, few experiences of uh, seeing an endocrinologist were disastrous. Um, I was referred to an endocrinologist who was overtly racist. Um, I persevered thinking that, um, you know, maybe I had been too harsh a judge, um, but it, it got to the point that every time I tried to see her, my blood pressure would go up every time I went in there. Um, and then going through looking for other um, services that I needed um, to really become much better educated about my condition um, just didn't occur. And then I was so busy working and, you know, trying to change the constitution and, you know, everything else that I really neglected um, my own health. But also on reflection, there were not enough uh, triggers in the system to really um, ensure that I got the understanding and the education I needed. Uh, certainly it got to the point that I felt I avoided healthcare because I felt every time I went to get any um, healthcare, I felt judged, uh, I felt um, put down, and I felt like I was made, I was blamed for my own health condition. Now, at the same time, I was advocating for both my parents who've now passed, um, but I was advocating for them in the health system. And I found that really easy to do, um, but I found it very hard to do that for myself. And, uh, I, you know, I hate to think what would have happened to my parents in the health system if I had not been there for them. And I know that in many cases, a lot of our peoples just don't have the kind of um, advocacy and support that um, I was able to give my family. Now, I'm someone who, um, you know, the first board I ever sat on was Mobbury Hospital when I was a 27-year-old. So I've sat on hospital boards. I've sat on primary health care boards. Um, I'm now on the board of the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education. Um, I was the deputy chair of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Equality Council for a period of time. Um, I've worked alongside Aboriginal health experts for in a whole range of ways for decades, and I still could not navigate the health system in a way that meant that I had my needs met. Um, and I'm pretty privileged compared to a lot of people. It's not like I don't have access to services, um, but I still have ended up um, losing a limb. Um, that's been really confronting. Um, and, you know, it's not my fault that I have um, the condition that I have, um, but it has been, uh, you know, 
the sort of thing that I would hope the voice can do more about in terms of making sure um, alongside institutions like SAMRI um, to, to do the kind of work that brings evidence to and voice to um, some of those really, really important conversations that we need the system to start responding to um, that to date has not done enough of. Um, but in saying that, I don't at all overlook the enormous effort of um, pioneers that have come before us um, that have been working towards improvements for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the health system. Um, but again, it's one of the key areas that I think a lot of us are pinning our hopes on being positively impacted through the voice. Thank you. Well, thanks for, for sharing such, um, you know, personal insights. And, you know, I think even for me, I, I think about my own family, I, you know, my, my, my parents, uncles, aunties, you know, grandparents, um, siblings, even myself, you know, have, definitely have got our own um, journey that we're undertaking around chronic disease and how to navigate that and how to support each other. Um, but yeah, I also, having the experience that I've had, not just around my health, but also working life, um, you know, it is a challenge to, to navigate, to get in there, to share the unique insights as an Aboriginal person in this country, as an Indigenous person in this country, and how we can make things better. And so, you know, I'm a firm believer that the voice is, is, a, is a positive step forward, but it's got a huge amount of work to do as well. It's not going to be easy. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's being in the room and then being able to navigate, you know, um, you know, I guess the mechanism that we're hopefully about to embark upon. Um, challenging, but very, very worth the investment from, for, for the future of, of us as a country. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we hear a lot of slogans throughout this, uh, throughout the campaign. Um, voice treaty truth is is one of those that we hear a lot of. I know you you, you touched on it, um, um, and that you know what what is in front of us right now is around voice. Um, you, you know you spoke about the the treaty process, the the Makarata process. You know that were all identified and highlighted in the Uluru statement from the heart. Um, and moving forward. Um, whether the referendum is successful or unsuccessful. Um, interested in, I guess, some of your thoughts around, you know, where, where, the, where treaty and truth telling should feature or, you know, in, in, the, in, I guess, the work ahead of us as Australians, particularly around our reconciliation commitment, which is quite significant across the country. Mm. Uh, I think, the Makarata Commission, I think, is really important. Um, Makarata is a Yongu word, uh, which means to come together after a struggle. Um, you know, we've got uh, different levels of uh, treaty and agreement making around Australia taking place already, which is really important um, and um, significant. But one of the things that I think, one of the reasons I think the Makarata Commission and a framework for looking at that agreement making around Australia is so important is because if you're living in a state um, and you're in the process of developing a treaty um, and anything like that, um, if you're living in a state or territory uh, where your um, government is not cashed up, if the economy is slow, if they have got significant um, challenges around um, their economic status, uh, what kind of uh, economic model can you hope to achieve uh, through a treaty making process? Um, and so the reason that I think the Makarata Commission is important is because I hope that it will have the opportunity to set clear benchmarks um, 
through which um, treaty making um, needs to observe to make sure that people aren't disadvantaged um, in um, comparable ways across the country. Um, I think, you know, I haven't heard too many people advocate for one national treaty amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, giving respect to the cultural um, differences um, amongst us, and that makes a lot of sense. But if there is no national benchmark that holds um, governments to account for things that they must observe by virtue of principle um, in relation to their dealings with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in relation to treaty making, um, then I think that that is um, pretty problematic and uh, could uh, result in uh, some people ending up with agreements that really don't end up serving their purposes very well after what will probably be decades of work that go into actually achieving the treaty in the first place. So I think the Makarata Commission will be incredibly important in terms of helping to uh, filter through what are the overarching principles that um, we should be looking at as um, a standard setting. When it comes to truth telling, um, I think that um, there wouldn't be too many of us at the moment that could really paint an accurate picture of uh, what that process will look like. But I do understand that there is work starting to take place in relation to what that um, what sort of framework needs to be put in place to enable that to be thought through. Um, certainly, um, there have been other truth telling type. Um, processes in other parts of the world that we can look at um, that have really enabled, um, you know, um, some sort of restorative justice to, to take place. Um, I think one of the things that we do know is that in Australia, um, even today, and we've seen this through some elements of the no case against the referendum, uh, really even questioning whether we're the first peoples of the country or not. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of us will understand and respect that, um, you know, when you're building a house, you don't start with the roof, you start with the foundation. And part of the foundation is really making sure that we're working from the same basis of understanding about where we've come from and, and what is taking place. So um, it's my hope that a truth-telling process will really um enable the country to um, hear and understand the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a more complete way. Certainly, we've had the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We've had the National Inquiry into um, the, the forced removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, and there'll be more inquiries. There'll be more Royal Commissions. Um, but what we really do need is a framework whereby Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can tell their truth, um, have that recorded um, and um, have that inform everything that um, we do in the future, but also inform us in such a way as that we don't make the same mistakes through policies and legislation that could very easily have us revisiting uh, a lot of the injustice that's happened in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess what I'm most excited about is with a successful referendum is that that truth telling can start, you know, can commence through the voice, can commence in that environment, can provide that, you know, that unique insight, but also that resilience and willingness to work together in going forward, you know, for the voice, for the Australian government, you know, around in a policy development program, development and delivery investment that's going to be happening and coming already, you know, like, it, yeah. And so, you know, I guess that's what I'm most hopeful of. Um, Tanya, we've got a few minutes to go. So I just wanted to kind of give you the floor. And, uh, you know, if there was, I guess, one key message that you wanted us to take away from today um, in, you know, contemplation and consideration for you know what we're about to do in a couple of weeks time um yeah I just want to give you the opportunity to to share some final thoughts thank you um look if you haven't already i just really encourage you to go to the yes um 23.com.au uh, website and sign up 
as a supporter. Um, the minute you do that, you'll be um, getting information about opportunities where you can help the yes case, whether that's um, through volunteering in uh, the pre-polling stages or on polling booths on voting days, doing leafleting, door knocking, phone banking, all the things that um, enable us to reach um, the Australian people to make sure that they're informed with accurate information before they go to vote. That's going to be absolutely essential. Um, and the other thing I would say is that... Um, you know, please don't overlook opportunities to ask questions of friends and family about um, what they know about this referendum so that they're well informed. Um, this is an incredibly rare opportunity. If this um, is not successful, I don't imagine that we're going to have another crack at it for a very long time, if at all. Um, and so, you know, I for myself want to know that I've done everything I can to... Um, try and help create um, a yes result. And if all of us um, say, yes, I'm going to do something, if we all do something, um, we do have a chance of, of winning this, um, particularly if we can reach the people who are currently undecided, which is a fair proportion. So um, please don't undersell um, the impact that you as an individual can have. Um, we can all be doing things um, that hopefully will make a difference and really give our country an opportunity to turn a corner um, and really set us on a path of some some new new conversations that are, you know, waiting to be had. Thanks, Tanya. Well, everyone that's joined us, um, I know we can't see you, but... Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you and a uh, round of applause. Um, yeah, it's been deadly to catch up with you, Tanya. I know there's been a heap going on um, professionally and personally, but really just, you know, thank you for your willingness to come and, and spend some time with us, um, share your insights. They are unique. They are extremely high level. Um, and, you know, um, I guess from my own experience, I know that, not everyone gets the opportunity to participate in things at, at that level here within Australia, within those boardrooms and meeting rooms that are that have that have you know that are shaping you know things like this. So um, your encouragement to really you know take hold of the opportunity we have individually also resonates you know with me. Um, and the fact that we're working and doing what we can within summary to share as much information with our people so so we're informed mm. um you know the you are 100 percent correct this you know this being the first referendum in the social media age there is there's a lot of information out there um that you know that in the spirit of it it's probably not what i would consider to be in the spirit of wanting to try and build um a fair and equitable nation. And so I guess that's my encouragement to everyone that's joining us and everyone that works here at Samory is, you know, regardless of our, our own conscious or unconscious bias, um, this is very much about what's best for the country going forward um, and the opportunity for us to actually have an individual and direct say of what that looks like. So just want to thank you again for joining us here on beautiful Ghana Yada. Um, and, uh, you know, wish you all the best with the grand final coming up this weekend, wherever your heart lies. I know where mine does. <laughs> Where's that, Clyde? Who are you going for? Uh, you know, like we're, we're interstate, so we've... <laughs> uh, hey, look, this is my fourth um, voice briefing that I've done today, and it's the first one that I've got through without being asked for grand final tickets, so that's fantastic because I have got <laughs> none left yeah. to come out, all right? Um, and I'm not even going myself this year. So, um, yeah, hopefully it's a cracking game. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Um, but, yeah, thanks again for your time, Tanya. Thanks again for being so generous with us. And, um, you know, we wish you the best with, you know, with your recovery. And, you know, if there's, any, if there's anything that we can do here from, you know, Samri and Wadley Pringer, don't be, don't be afraid to reach out. You know, we're... Um, 
Yeah, even though we, you know, we're, we're very much about how we can support our community as well and the yes. work that we do. So, um, yeah, thanks again. And um, hopefully we get a chance to catch up soon. That'd be great. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye. Bye.